Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. The uh, kinds of experiences that you write about, which I think really gets to the heart of the mystery, is when uh, patients who are near death seem to experience the presence of other people, relatives of theirs, for example, who, who may have uh, predeceased them and, uh, uh, and they didn't even know that. Now that's an interesting one because that is an area where you will find health care providers uh, uh, with, a, with a little bit more ease mm -hmm. around that experience. Because and I, it's so common? I think it's more common. Mm -hmm. I think it's more common. And uh, things that are more common that we see with mm -hmm. more regularity, we yeah. can find a space for it within our uh, understanding of the world. And um, especially nurses who work with patients who are um, close to death. Mm -hmm. Hospice nurses and hospice physicians in particular will talk about bedside visitations mm -hmm. and their ability to um, their apparent ability to have conversations with people yes. they know who have crossed over. And mm -hmm. I've certainly had patients share those experiences mm -hmm. with me. You wrote in one instance about a nurse who was very disturbed uh, when she saw a patient engaging in conversation with someone she couldn't see, the nurse couldn't see. Right, and I, and I understand her concern. I do. I, I had a nurse call me not long before uh, the, uh, my, the I was tying up the book, and she was very concerned mm -hmm. about a patient under her care who was close to death, and she said that she's talking to people. I think she is um, maybe hallucinating, mm -hmm. and she actually called me. I was on call. She right. called me to see if I might consider prescribing a medication that would address these hallucinations. An antipsychotic. Right, mm -hmm. and um, so I said to her, Does she, is she in distress? Well, no, she doesn't seem to be in distress. Um, so then I ha was able to have a conversation ar ar with her around this to mm -hmm. suggest that, well, if she's not in distress, this might be one of the a situation that we see in patients who are close to death who are having bedside conversations. Um, and that's uncomfortable for mm -hmm. some people to consider. Uh, one of the things that I, I thought was so important to me to convey in this book is that we're talking about phenomenon that we can't prove happen or didn't happen and the patient can't prove to us that they uh, did happen or right. are happening, is yeah. there some way that we can find a middle ground mm -hmm. to respect the patient's experience mm -hmm. and to not judge it? Right. I mean, certainly a patient would be very sensitive if they thought their doctor was uh, denying something mm -hmm. that seemed so very real to them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's an important point, too, is that we often, and I wish I could say it, I'm exaggerating, but I have seen my colleagues deny a patient's experience, mm -hmm. and that is a very important part of this dialogue. Because mm -hmm. um, that can really be harmful to a patient. It can be harmful. Certainly, patients hallucinate. Mm -hmm. Certainly, patients interpret physical stimuli in a non-physical way, mm -hmm. but I think there's a growing body of evidence that they're along this spectrum of anomalous experiences of consciousness, there are other things for which we do not have a tidy explanation mm -hmm. that seem to transcend our physical world. And do we need to really have it proven to honor somebody's mm -hmm. experience? No. Do we really need to understand how it happens to convince ourselves that it's real? No. It's not our experience, yeah. and it's not our place to judge it. And furthermore, there is a background literature that suggests people actually do have out-of-body experiences, and sometimes they come back from those experiences and, and report things that are later determined to be veridical or verifiable. Exactly.